eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Association. I'm at Lauderdale Marine Center, and today I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Heather Lee O'Keefe. Welcome back, Heather. Thank you for having me back, Paul. I learned so much last year at Yacht Engineering Week 2020, and I'm excited to crank it up a notch for 2021 and learn even more. Well, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you here. We've got so much to cover. As the audience is going to see, we're going to have to divide and conquer because we've got segments that span engines and drive lane, drive line and uh, HVAC systems, we've got top coats, we've got stabilizers, we've got electronics. You've gone out and done some segments, I've gone out and done some segments, we've done a few together. What did you learn last year? What did you think about last year's event? I learned that there is more than meets the eye in the yacht industry. I mean, I had no idea that all of these topics even existed. Like all those things you just mentioned last year, I wouldn't have known what you're talking about, but now I have a little bit more knowledge than I came in with. <laughs> well, and the great benefit of us being able to do this is we can speak to a lot of different topics. It is a very complex industry. Our audience is primarily made up of the yacht brokerage community, as well as affiliate members of the association as well. So people on the service side, insurance, financing, lawyers, all sorts of folks. So there's gonna be something for everyone and some of it's gonna to appeal to everyone or, or some all of it's gonna to appeal to a few different people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we'll hope that you'll stay with us. It'll be every morning from nine until 10.30. Uh, we, we couldn't have done this without the generous support and we want to give a thank you to our sponsors. Uh, number one, obviously Caterpillar. They provided us with some shade to keep the sun off us. Uh, they also anchored us with a 2400 horsepower C32B high performance 12 cylinder triple turbo diesel engine. Uh, we have a whole host of sponsors that have helped us with this year's event. Uh, I couldn't possibly remember all of them off the top of my head. So we're gonna to have to do that thank you in a completely separate segment. So Heather, um, we're gonna run five mornings this week, nine till 10.30. Um, you've done a few different segments with us so far. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll break from here. I'm gonna run out on the dock and I'm gonna meet Brian Fowler from Caterpillar. And if I'm not mistaken, you're gonna go over to the shop and you're gonna meet with Raphael and learn more than you ever needed to know about plate style heat exchangers. I'm ready to go and I'm gonna be asking all the questions that you guys at home are too afraid to ask as always. <laughs> all right, well, we look forward to giving you a great presentation. Please stay with us all week, Monday through Friday. Thanks to everyone for being here and let's get on with the show. Okay, we're out on the docks. As I mentioned, the folks at Hargrave have been generous enough to allow us to come aboard the new 85 so we can have an overview of the cooling system. Brian Fowler from Pantropic Caterpillar is gonna join us. So let's go see if we can find him and have a peek at what we're talking about today. That was easy to find him because Brian's right there on the boat ready for it. Good morning, Brian. Hey, Paul. How are you? Good, how are Mind you? Mind if I come aboard? Yeah, welcome aboard. Nice to see you, buddy. Thank All you right. so much. Let's invite the audience aboard as well and we'll have a peek at what we're talking about. Come on aboard. There you go. All right. So Brian, before we jump inside, what I'd like to do is I'd like you to give me a moment of overview of what are we talking about with a cooling system in today's modern diesel engine? Sure. Actually, before you even do that, I got a better idea. I've already had COVID. So have I. 
So I think we both got the antibodies. I feel comfortable with you. I do. Let's take these off because they can hear us better and That's we don't want to deprive them of this, right? Of course not. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the raw water cooling system and what it does on the modern diesel engine. Where does it start and where does it end, Brian? Right. So simply, cooling system is not black magic. Where you've got water outside of the boat. You need to get that water in the boat as clean as you can reasonably make it. You pump the water through components through the engine, transmission, and then back overboard. And the whole goal is hopefully to get an equal amount back overboard in a contained environment. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, let's go in the engine room and see how we get that done. All right. All right. Come on with me. All right. Come on down. We've got great access to the engine room in this new 85 Hargrave. What a beautiful spot. Yeah. Yeah, this is a whole really lot better than trying to do it in a 36 TR, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Really That's appreciate indeed. Hargrave. Yeah, they're doing a great job for us. We appreciate that. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at, as Brian mentioned, the water has to come in the boat. Let's see where it comes in. In this particular boat, Brian, what do we got? Right. Well, we've got a strainer system, that, which is uh, Hargrave specific. It's very nice, uh, but that can vary from boat to boat, builder to builder. But each manufacturer um, has to accomplish the same task, and okay. that is getting water in the boat and filtering it in some manner. So we have cool, clean water supplied to the engine. Yes. Okay. So yeah. from there, let's see where it goes. All right. From there, you'll make your way. So this is our main line coming off the strainer, which goes into your seawater pump. Auxiliary raw water pump It's also known as. Standard rubber impellered pump, very okay. common. Uh, throughout the industry, you've got this plate right here. There's a rubber impeller, easy access. You can change it underway. And from this pump, you've got, well, you've got a couple of zincs here, which we'll get into, but then you make your way out and around. Okay. So when the water comes out of the pump, we're going to stay on this engine mm -hmm. because although we've got two engines and it makes it really convenient to be able to see the inboard side, let's take a look on this engine to follow the water flow. So we're going to come out of the raw right. water pump and now, then what happens? Right. So we're coming up into this pipe right here. So stop right there. You said we come into a pipe and what's that pipe made of? This pipe is brass, bronze. Okay. okay. So it's a metal pipe. Yes. Metal so pipe. we got raw water going through a metal pipe. Mm -hmm. What happens there? Right. So any two to similar metals in seawater creates a battery okay. essentially. All so right. And what does that cause? Electrolysis. electrolysis. Okay. So with electrolysis, we're trying to mitigate the corrosion. So we're in, in this case, we use a zinc anode, which is our sacrificial metal. Okay. It's, so it's, zinc being a softer metal than bronze or brass gives us the ability for the electrolysis to be attracted to that like metal shavings to a magnet almost. Yes, exactly. So any isolated metal component in the cooling system has to be protected either by a zinc anode or it can be in the bonding system bonding. so that it would carry that electrical current, the electrolysis away to a, a maybe a common sacrificial anode. Right, common to uh, so your strut zinc or your shaft zinc, zinc on the back of the zinc boat. Zinc on the back of the boat, you know, anything in the water. Okay, yeah. awesome. So we've seen that the water's gonna come out of the pump, gonna come through a pipe that's gonna be protected, then where's it go? Right, then we're going in here to the after cooler. All right. So. This after cooler is our seawater air cooling system. It uh, is also known as an intercooler with other manufacturers. Okay, yeah, older older technologies, older school. They called it an intercooler quite a lot. After cooler, and the reason we call it an after cooler is because it's cooling the air after it is compressed in the turbocharger, correct? Correct. Okay, and when we compress the air in the turbocharger, what happens to that air? Compressed air creates heat. Okay, so we want to remove the heat from the heat that out. air yeah. because cold air. Cold air makes horsepower. Cold air is denser with more oxygen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to pull the air from the turbocharger through the after cooler, cooled by the raw water, and that air enters the engine. So now the air is moved away. Where's the water going to go? Right, so we keep moving along and we make our way out another pipe, zinc protected, okay. into your heat exchanger. Plate, okay. This is a plate type heat exchanger. All right. So the plate type heat exchanger is, although it's not brand new, it's a newer style of heat exchanger than what was used in years past, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The tube and bundle style. So the old tube yeah. and bundles, they were either round or actually on some of the old two stroke motors that we all mm -hmm. are familiar with. It was a big rectangular Square. box. Yeah. Okay. And it had a round plate on the side that that bundle would come out of. 
Right, and those bundles were also made of soft metals just to try and remove as much heat as you could. Okay. Uh, but obviously there was corrosion issues with those along the way. So the, it, that's why the, these titanium plates type are becoming the standard. Okay, uh, and because tell me a little bit about titanium, because titanium is a space age metal. It's an expensive metal too, in theory, but uh, it's it's actually pretty pretty common. Okay, um, and it's it's highly corrosion resistant. Okay, and it's important also, in a saltwater environment. Absolutely, and it also rejects heat very well. Okay, so it's it's a great to use in this system where you've basically got these plates here, where seawater is going one direction, cooling is going the other and it's pulling the heat out of that coolant as it goes by. Okay, so in this particular application, if I'm not mistaken, it's a dual purpose coolant because it's not only cooling the seawater, excuse me, cooling the engine water, but it's also cooling the fuel. Correct, yeah, okay. we've got our fuel lines here, whereas part of these plates here will cool the fuel. Okay, so this is a great opportunity because the folks at Pantropic have been generous enough to invite Heather over to the shop and Raphael has two heat exchangers on the bench over at the shop, completely disassembled. One of them has been cleaned, the other one has not yet been cleaned. So it gives us a unique opportunity to have a look at what happens to a heat exchanger through its service life, and then what do they do about it to return it back to new condition and why they're using the titanium because it's such a resilient material. Heather, we're gonna give it over to you and let you and Raphael give us an in-depth look at heat exchangers. Thank you, Paul. I am here at the Pantropic Service Shop in Fort Lauderdale with Raphael Betts. We are fortunate enough to have the two heat exchangers that Paul was talking about. We have one that has been cleaned and one that hasn't been cleaned. So we're going to take a look at it. Hey, Heather, how are you? Good morning, Raphael. Look at that. What? Look at that. <laughs> I like it. You're doing good? Good to see you again? Good to see you again, too. Absolutely. I remember last year we were cool without the mask. Are you cool without the mask? I'm good. We're good. All right. Excellent. Let's take them off. Oh, I can breathe again. <laughs> I can breathe again. All right. So show me, what are we looking at here? Yeah. So we've got two heat exchangers, right? And so we were fortunate enough to have one cleaned and one not cleaned. Mm -hmm. uh, these units have a roughly 700 hours on them. So we're going to get a good look at kind of what starts to happen. And when your service interval starts to come up at about 1,000 hours. So let's start with the dirty one. Okay. Okay. Let's take a look. So just a couple key pieces here. So this is the front plate here. Okay. Okay. And so that goes on the front mount. This is the rear frame. And then these are all the plates that go in between. Okay. These okay. plates are made out of titanium. Uh, mm -hmm. Titanium is a really good conductor of heat in the sense that it gets hot fast and it cools fast. So okay. it works really, really well that way. Um, and it also is extremely corrosive resistant. Okay. Gotcha. Um, in its conductivity, it's about a quarter better conductor than iron and about one twenty third better than copper. Wow. So when you kind of get a little reference point there, right? And then the corrosive scale on a one to 12, it's floating between 11 and 12, depending on what grade of titanium that you use. So it's really, really good product. It's expensive. It's considered a rare metal, right? It's a precious metal, um, but it's expensive, but it lasts a really long time and they're extremely durable. And it allows uh, Caterpillar to design these in a very thin manner so that you can use them quite a bit. So you can see they're super, they're almost paper thin. Yeah. And they seem a little wobbly, but they're very, very durable when you stack them and then you compress them. Okay. Okay. So, so these come in a stack like this? Yep, and they'll and vary. They just compress? Yep, okay. and they'll vary in size, right? Depending on the requirement and the cooling capacity of the engine, they'll vary in size. You'll have some that stacks are a little bit shorter and you'll have some, this is one of the larger ones. Okay. So on higher horsepower engines, you'll see a little bit bigger stack. Okay. Okay. Um, and so then you have gaskets in between and you also have these little O-ring pucks that go in there. Ooh. Yeah, there's a little grime <laughs> in there, right? So like I said, this one's got roughly seven, 800 hours on it. And so you can see that you start to see some of the corrosion happening that we'll show you very specifically in a second, but you also see some of the sediment and stuff that can get into the heat exchanger, right? So right. this is why sea strainers are so important, but you'll start to see some growth. Okay. Sure. You see little things coming in there. You start to see a little bit of growth in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you get into the stack a little bit, you can kind of see how dirty it can get. Oh, so what is all that? So it's just growth. It's, okay. you know, there's microorganisms in the seawater. Right. I think we talked about that last time. I think so. But so those <laughs> microorganisms will go find a nice warm home. Mm -hmm. And when the engine's not running, they'll just plant themselves and they'll start to grow. Hmm. And so you can see some coolant here, which, you know, you got coolant seawater flowing through here. And in this particular stack, you also have a fuel cooler. And so that usually uses about five plates. Okay. Okay. 
And so that works that way. Let me clean my hands here real quick. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so this is the rear frame. And so this is where your seawater inlet that, that Paul and, and Brian spoke about earlier. And, and you got your seawater coming in and then your seawater goes out. So it comes in this pipe here. You got a zinc anode here, right? Okay. Okay. So let's show you what happens after about 700 hours. You let's ready? Let's see. I'm ready. So oh. that zinc's not pretty anymore. That is so not it starts pretty. to corrode. And so what happens is that this now doesn't work anymore. So people will look mm -hmm. at this and say, oh, it's still there. It's working. At this point, it's time to change. It, yeah, you know? it looks like it's time time for a new one. Yep. And so what <laughs> happens is this elbow starts to get very similar corrosion. I see. So you can see all the pitting starting to happen, the flaking, right? Let's see if we can get this ring out without too much trouble. Too much trouble. Too so much trouble. That ring trouble, comes out. You're right. going to see a little bit more of that. <laughs> and so ultimately, this this elbow is not in horrible shape. Okay. And it can be cleaned and can be set back into a good position, but for the most part, you want to avoid that, okay? Okay. And then you'll see in here, you can start to see some of the corrosion that comes in here. You get some calcium buildup and you can see it around the rings. So all this gets cleaned in the process. When we take these apart, this will all get cleaned and polished again, make sure the surfaces are flat and they'll be able to seal properly, mm -hmm. okay? And so that happens there. So that's what it looks like at about 700 hours. Okay, now okay. is this one that has been properly taken care of or is this just what happened yeah this is pretty normal this okay. is a vessel that, that has good maintenance practices um this is pretty normal for about this time of period period of time sorry okay and you know look we live in a harsh environment we're sure. in south florida it's hot it's humid so all of these things create conductors and those conductors expound all these problems that we have on these heat exchangers mm -hmm. so it's very very important to do that you know so okay Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. We preach Absolutely. it all the time, right? <laughs> so let's look at one that looks pretty clean. So this one's been serviced. Okay. And you can see that the, the surf, you can kind of see a little bit of the wear. That's from yeah. cavitation from the plates and the seawater okay. going through there. But you can see how polished it is. Yes. Looks a lot different, right? A lot better than the other one. Yep. And so now <laughs> we're looking at these plates and big difference. Oh, really yeah. clean now. They look good as new. Yeah, they do. They clean up really, really well. So titanium organically creates this oxide film and that's what keeps the corrosiveness down. That's what's its real protector. And it does it naturally. So it's not something that has to be chemically created. Um, so you're not, there's no room for error, for example, right? And so it does that with the stack. Um, gaskets, very important. If you maintain your heat exchangers and you do it properly, you stay on schedule, you can get three to 4,000 hours out of these gaskets. Wow. Which is a long time. That is more than the useful life for most owners, right? If you don't, you can expect a hefty, hefty cost of replacement because these gaskets will swell. They won't sit properly anymore. You won't be able to seal the stack. The stack is sealed through compression mm -hmm. and it's set. So these gaskets, when you buy them brand new, they're 0.4 millimeters in thickness. As you compress oh, wow. them over time, they'll reduce their thickness right? Just like anything else. Sure. And so when you can't get that 0.4 millimeters, you can't compress the stack properly and you'll start to leak. So then so, you will need to replace all yep. of that. Yeah. Cause you, okay. for you to go through and measure every single one, you find the three <laughs> that are bad, it's not going to be worth it. Cause what's going to happen is you might find the three or six or 10 that are bad, but very shortly after that, you're going to have another the three or six or 10 that are going to go bad. Gotcha. And so then you're going to have a leak and then that's not good customer service. So, right. you know, so we want to maintain maintenance. You want to stay on your intervals. You want to stay on your schedule because that's what keeps these costs down in your maintenance costs. Absolutely. Now, speaking of cost, what um, is the average cost for this kind of cleaning service? So the average cost for something like this is right around 12 to $1,500. So okay. that's removal, that's cleaning, that's pressure testing, that's inspections, and then reinstallation. Okay. And then about how often again? A thousand hours. Okay. Yep. You so want to in do the grand scheme hours. of things, I mean, that's pretty worth it instead of having to replace an Absolutely. Entire... I mean, we always talk about it, right? You got a $15 million investment, right? In right. A, in a, in, we'll call it a toy, but in your pleasure, you have a $15 million investment and you're only talking about spending 2,500 bucks every thousand hours to make sure that you can enjoy your investment. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, any other questions? I, th I think that's it. Thank you very much, Raphael. Awesome. And yeah. you heard it from him. Get it before it's too late <laughs> and keep up on your maintenance. Absolutely. Thanks so, again. Thank so we'll you, shoot Raphael. it back to those guys. Yeah, back to you, Paul. Heather, I got to tell you, 
we now know more about plate style heat exchangers than we ever thought we needed to. But that's really interesting and really fascinating how it works, why they use the materials they do, and how Raphael is able to, to basically make it new again after it's been in use. So we're going to continue along in our discussion of the raw water system, and the water is now going to exit the heat exchanger. We're going to go to Brian and find out where it goes. Brian? Right. Hey, so the heat exchanger, we moved over to this engine. We're coming off of here, same, this hose to this main coolant pipe or seawater pipe. We're heading aft. We're going to get to this splitter here. So this is basically where the engine stops and the boat takes over. Hargrave's done a great job here of, of splitting and plumbing this in place. Nice valves. You can see everything's bonded like it should be. Pressure valves. It's a it's great installation. But so our, our water is split in half here. Half is going this way, which goes to your transmission cooler in and out of the cooler and then it joins this main line again and just heads up to your follows up here and goes into your exhaust elbow which you can see is also bonded pressure gauges so you can if you get a restriction here you can see it which would tell you that there might be uh you know restriction which could be as as far back as the transmission cooler which often gets overlooked or forward up to heat exchanger, after cooler, pump, your pump impeller blades may be starting to get old. They get a little memory to them. They don't pump quite as much as they used to. You know, that's having something like that on the end of the system that you can monitor is, is a huge help. So that goes back to our original discussion that we want to have equal amounts of water coming in and going out through our controlled environment. Yeah. So some of what we've talked about here, Brian, we've kind of taken for granted. Uh, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to highlight is the way Hargrave installed the pressure gauges in here, what a phenomenal diagnostic tool that is. If you don't know what you're looking at, then why would you put that gauge there? But knowing what you're looking at, what is it that you're trying to determine there? Right. So if you've got, well, when everything's brand new, clean, right? you can, you, you can see where your restrictions are going to be in the system, and you kind of make note of that. Okay. And or maybe even put an indicator on the gauge right. so you, that it's easy to tell if the pressure's sure. increased or decreased. Yeah, you've got a couple of engineers. You can put a little tape mark on it. Sure. And then you've got a baseline to move off of. Okay. So down the road, as this transmission cooler gets dirty or your heat exchanger gets growth on it, you know, the impeller, whatever, you'll see this here. That, that, that pressure change. It'll, It'll go start up. to the fluctuate and increase. Yeah. Okay. okay. So there are a couple of different things that we're talking about here. Um, one of which is, it's not that you're doing anything wrong if that pressure starts to increase a little bit. That's just natural in the service life of the cooling system. And that's why we have to go into it on regular intervals, disassemble components, clean them properly, and return them to service in a new fashion so that we're keeping that heat down. So speaking of heat, what's going on in modern engines today? What we used to do is we used to look for 165 to 180 degrees of freshwater cooling temperature in our engine. We knew things were OK. Right. Well, today I look at a Caterpillar heat, heat, heat engage and it's 210 degrees. Yeah. What's going on? Uh, with uh, emissions changes over the last 20 years Okay. Uh, in, in an effort to clean up, we run the engines warmer okay it burns off more particulate okay so essentially we with the increased emissions we're building horsepower along the way but we're, we're uh, running warmer so the engineers have determined through their studies that the increased horsepower coming from these engines obviously is creating more heat but it's better for emission standards to be able to run that engine hotter as you said it burns off more particulate now, if I recall correctly from high school chemistry, water boils at 212 degrees. So if we've got water in the engine and it's running at 210 degrees, that's two degrees away from a critical point. What are we doing in there to increase that boiling point so that we can run this engine hotter? Right, well, it's a pressurized system. Ah, so there's a start. Another thing that we learned in chemistry class is that your boiling point increases if you pressurize the fluid that you're boiling. Correct. Okay, and what else can we do? And and the, the coolant that we use has got glycol. Glycol raises that level as well. Okay, and the glycol not only raises that coolant temperature or cooling temperature, 
but also there are corrosion inhibitors in that coolant additive as well, aren't there? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's on the freshwater side, which is a discussion that we'll have another day. That's it. Excellent. So what we've got is we've got raw water coming into the engine. We've got it going through the after pump to the after cooler, from the after cooler to the heat exchanger, which does a dual duty in this one as a heat exchanger and a fuel cooler. It comes out of the heat exchanger and fuel cooler, and it goes back through the piping and it goes to the transmission cooler. And then from the transmission cooler, it goes up into, well, there's also an oil cooler in that system that we didn't point out directly, but again, we're cooling engine oil, right? Right, and in this case, it's used uh, coolant, so it's out of that raw water loop. Ah, okay, so in this case, it's a freshwater oil cooler. All right, so that's not a part of our raw water discussion on this engine. But after it comes down through the transmission cooler, then it goes to the exhaust system in the shower head where the water sprays and cools the air as it exits the boat, the exhaust air. Cooling the exhaust. So you can pump it overboard through fiberglass piping. Okay, and it won't damage the fiberglass because it's not as resistant to heat as these high temperature elbows are. Correct. Coming off the turbines. Yeah, there's nothing to it, right? It's simple. I thought it was black magic. I know, yeah. Not Put at it all. In, move it along, get it out. Get it in, get it out. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think we've got a good handle on our cooling system from start to finish. I think everybody has a great understanding. Again, I want to thank Heather and Raphael from over in the shop, giving us a really great idea of how the heat exchanger works and the materials of the heat exchanger and how to clean it. Last year, we talked about the after cooler. This year, we talked about the heat exchanger. Maybe next year, we'll figure something else out downstream and talk about that. Thanks, Brian, so much for everything. I really appreciate the great explanation and your hospitality here. Thanks to the folks at Hargrave for doing a beautiful job of helping us aboard. And we're going to cut in a moment here and move to our next segment. We'll be back after a commercial break. Thanks for joining us. Yacht Engineering Week 2021 has been made possible by Pantropic Power, the only authorized Caterpillar Power Systems dealer in South Florida. Florida Nautical Surveyors, your complete solution to all of your vessel surveying needs. And Robert Allen Law, exclusively dealing with the business of yachting. We would also like to thank Quantum Stabilizers, AME Solutions, D'Angelo Exhaust, MPI Marine Professionals Incorporated, Concord Marine Electronics, Lauderdale Marine Center, Marine Data, Isotropic, Dockmate, and Murray Ventilation Products. We'll be right back. Hello, welcome to Caterpillar Miami Lakes Learning Center. I would like to talk to you about our new C32B high performance marine engine. The new engine is offered in three ratings, the 2000, the 2200, and the 2400 brake horsepower, all rated at 2300 RPM. The core of this engine has been completely upgraded for increased power density capability. We have increased the compression height on the pistons. The connecting rods also been redesigned for more power capability. Of course, the crankshaft has increased in size and strength and we've also changed the main bearing size. We've upgraded the cylinder block to accommodate the change and also the cylinder heads have been optimized with the improved water jacket and integrated fuel lines. The fuel system has been updated with an enhanced unit injection fuel system. With the split shot capability enables us to make sound reductions at trolling and low engine speeds. The fuel filtration system has been upgraded for optimal performance. The charge air system has been upgraded to a three turbo sequential air system. We can control the sequence of how the turbos are utilized as the engine speed and power increase. The cooling system update includes a larger after cooler core and a second rubber impeller seawater pump. So now there's a seawater pump on the front and the rear of the engine. A dedicated circuit for the after-cooler and a dedicated circuit for the jacket water heat exchanger. However, we maintain a single inlet and outlet seawater connection. 
the seawater system is electrically bonded, so there is no longer zinc anodes to replace. For electronics, we've upgraded to the latest CAD ECM technology, the Atom 6, with faster and larger processor. We will offer duplex fuel and oil filtration, marine alarm and protection system, and dual ECMs to meet MCS requirements when requested. Also available, optional electric fuel priming pump, a 500-hour oil pan to complement the standard 250-hour offer. Engine will be certified for EPA Tier 3 recreational, IMO 2 and IMO 3 switchable. It will also come with an integrated SCR system certified at the factory. We're excited to add a new chapter to the C32 legacy and bring this new C32B high performance engine to the market. All right, and we're back. We've learned everything I think there is to know, Heather, about the cooling system on a modern high-performance diesel engine. Yes, I learned more than I'll ever need to know about heat exchange systems and how it cools both the fuel, the water, etc. cetera. It's, uh, it's a very complex system and it's critically important. Now, our next segment, I understand you've got a new title. I think we're gonna be calling you Captain Heather. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to Mark Carreri with DocMate and we're gonna learn about remote docking systems. Welcome back. I am here on the Intercoastal on a beautiful yacht where I'm going to learn how to maneuver it by a remote control. I'm here with Mark Curary. How are you? Mate. Good to see you Good again. To see how you are again, you? Mark? Right? Nice. Yes. <laughs> right? Shaking. You never know what to do. Yes. Well, thank you for having us today. No problem. Beautiful day here it in is, Del Rey. Is. So tell us what is uh, DocMate? So DocMate is a handheld um, remote for boat owners. Okay. It'll wirelessly control the boat's engines thrusters, anchor, and horn from a wireless device, okay? It avoids the um, difficult docking situations and gives the owners a better boating experience. Wow, so that little thing controls this whole, whole boat. It controls the whole boat. Wow. The engines, the thrusters, all of it. My TV remote is bigger than that. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. So who would buy a DockMate system? So, um, I mean, pretty much, anybody anybody that has a boat can buy a dock mate right so there's different types of dock mates but um there's this boat is being uh handled by a captain and he's using a dock mate okay you got uh boat owners uh husband and wife team that maneuver by themselves they travel they do the great loop or whatever the case may be um that's an ideal situation for a dock mate system you know one person inside maneuvering the boat the other person's out doing lines. Now with a dock mate, more, both of them can be outside or one person can single hand the boat. It may not be that they want to go on the boat by themselves, but they want to single hand the boat, do it by themselves. Okay, right? so short answer, anyone with a boat can have a Pretty dock Pretty much mate? anyone with a boat, right? Good to know, good to know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Will a dockmate system work on any boat or does it need to have some kind of special equipment on board? So um, I don't really want to limit myself, but anything with electronic controls. Okay. okay? So anything pretty much past uh, 2000, the year 2000, has electronic controls. And then we're going to connect into those controls uh, and maneuver the boat. Now, I'm sure DockMate isn't the only wireless remote control system. What makes DockMate different than your competitors? So, um, yeah, I mean, we're not the only ones out there, but uh, we are different. And we like to say like, there's like big three differences. You okay. know what I mean? So one is our communication, uh, two is our proportional throttle control, and three is our specialized proprietary dock control software. So I'll get a little more granular on that, right? Okay. So um, our, our communication is a two-way communication between our remote and our receiver so that the remote always knows that it's in communication. Okay, so um, if they were to lose signal for some reason, we have a light here that lights up and lets you know that you've lost signal, okay? The remote also beeps, right? The remote beeps, and then the remote also vibrates 
so when you're outside and you're maneuvering the boat and you got the engines and the exhaust, you would actually know that something happened. Someone accidentally shuts the breaker off or something like that. So that's a really big uh, thing. And we use frequency hopping spread spectrum technology, which is like, I see you going, whoa. What yes, is that? That's like a big <laughs> word, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's technology that's been out for several years. And uh, it means that we use um, six different channels simultaneously. And the uh, channel changes six times a second. Oh, wow. So what that translates for you is like a very robust, secure, frequency okay okay so um, so there's really no sign of dropouts you're not gonna have any issues with that and the range is like really far I mean we started like hundred and sixty five feet in it we've gone all the way up to parking lots and it's been no problem whatsoever wow. right so the next is our proportional throttle control which means that you know when you maneuver the joystick a little bit here is just in, in gear and as you move the joystick more and more you get more throttle or variable like smooth throttle control Okay, okay, so a lot of times when you're docking a boat or coming into a marina, you need a little more than idle speed, mm -hmm. right? And it could be just a, you know, 50 RPMs or it could be a couple hundred RPMs depending on the types of boat. So we can do that and we can adjust that. Um, and the third is our dock control software. So what I said about the throttle, how much throttle? So let's mm -hmm. just say a boat like this, um, you know, 57 foot Sunseeker might need 5% throttle, but uh, a mm -hmm. trawler, that has much smaller engines might need like 30%, you know, throttle. So it really depends on the boat. It's, it's, this is not a one size fits all product. It's you customize it to make it what you want or what the, what the owners want, which is a really big deal, right? So that's our software. We developed it, it and it's only uh, for DocMate. So that is, those are like our big three. There's several other differences, but um, those are like the three that really separate us from the competition. What types of boats are most likely to enjoy the greatest benefit of a dockmate system? Well, again, like I hate to limit myself, but like anything from 28 feet is the smallest we've done up to 130 feet. So anywhere in between. I mean, it really just depends on, you know, the owners. Uh, so, you know, if the 30, let's just say the 28 footer, that guy mm -hmm. likes to go out and fish by himself. So he uses the dockmate while he's fishing, right? And we have sport fish guys that do the same thing. The larger motor yacht type guys, they're maneuvering the boat with their husband and wife and, you know, they just need the help. So it's, I mean, the range is not an issue for us. So, I mean, you go much bigger than 130 feet, you probably have a full-time crew, but um, some captains like to have a dock mate just like this guy, just so that he can leave the helm and maybe there's no wing station on those boats, right? So instead of installing a wing station, you know, out on the side of the boat, we can install a dockmate system and now the captain has full control over the boat, so. I think I know the answer to this one, but do you think that having a dockmate on a boat improves its resale value? I mean, of course, right? <laughs> I mean, of course. Um, so the real answer is, uh, well, yes. I mean, it's uh, just like if uh, you have two of the same boat and one of them has updated uh, electronics and maybe AV packages, you know, that boat that's updated is gonna sell before uh, the boat that doesn't. So same thing, if a boat has a dockmate system on there, um, then and a boat doesn't have it, the owners will most likely go to the boat that has a dockmate or a wireless remote control system on there before the one that doesn't have one, right? So uh, yeah, it definitely adds value and it'll make the boat sell first. So, uh, or before the other one, I would, I would bet, right? <laughs> All right. Cool. What unique features make dockmate the best in terms of safety and technology? So, um, there's a lot, but this is one of our big three that we talked about just a little bit ago. So um, the frequency hopping spread spectrum technology, that two-way communication between us, uh, it really ensures that, um, that there's not gonna be any interference. This is the same technology that cell phones use, Bluetooth uses, Wi-Fi uses. I mean, like it's a, it's a technology that's out there and everybody's using it. It just it just happens in the background, right? So that there's not any interference between other, you know, dockmate systems, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's other systems out there that use specifically like two channels. And, you know, those, all of those remotes are on those specific channels. So you might go, hmm, that might be a little scary if every single wireless remote control is on those two specific channels. There's, a, every dockmate has u six unique channels, okay? So there's never ever any dockmate system that's gonna be on those same six unique channels. So that's a huge safety feature. And another thing we do, which is kind of like a little trick, is 
Um, when we're done installing the DockMate system, we ask the dealers to actually grab the remote and just walk as far as they can down the dock, right? Just, you know, just keep walking until the thing cuts out. And in a lot of cases, like, it will never cut out. It's just the distance, you know, the, the range is so long. So we do that because a lot of people are just skeptical on, you know, the RF communication. Oh my God, is my boat gonna like fail? Is this gonna drop out on me? So we do that so that people understand that like the range is so far. And if you're on a 60 foot boat and you're 30 feet in one direction and 30 feet in another direction from where the remote, from the, where the receiver is, is mounted, you're so far inside that, you know, range that like it's never an issue. So, you know, the range thing is something that's very robust for, for DockMate. And uh, it's definitely one of our safety, best safety features for sure. Okay. So you mentioned a great range of motion with the dock mate. Yeah. Does this mean I can control it like from my apartment? <laughs> um, you know, it's, we don't like you to do that. Uh, okay. The range is possible, <laughs> but um, you know, so people will ask us like, uh, so the boat needs to move a slip over. The marinas told them they have to move from one slip to another. So can I just untie my lines, maneuver the boat and then back in? Um, you know, technically you could do that, although we frown against it. We really want you to be on the boat. Now, uh, just a, a common usage is that, you know, we'll, they'll maneuver the boat and then they'll hop off the dock, off the boat, onto the dock to tie a line up. The bow will start to fall off the dock a little bit because the wind is blowing it off and they'll just hit the bow thruster to move the boat back over to the dock. That's a common use for, for the dock mate. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but no, you don't want to be standing on the dock and maneuvering your boat. This is not like a remote control boat. You know what I mean? That's gotcha. The, uh, we we uh, <laughs> we don't recommend that at all, really. So. All right. Cool. So tell me a little bit about the installation of the DockMate system. Is it intrusive? Can it cause any issues with the existing engine and thruster controls? The installation is very very simple. Let me let me show you what we got underneath. Okay. So this is the DockMate receiver that's installed on this boat. It's completely IP67, which means that it is uh, completely waterproof and submersible. Wow. Okay, it's mounted underneath the dash though, so if that's getting wet, you have some other problems. But it, <laughs> but it is completely waterproof. And this is the only antenna we need for our signal to go as far as it goes. So depending on the types of engines and stuff we have, they're all pre-made cables. Okay, so there's no cutting or splicing or any of that involved, okay? And if it's a Volvo boat, we buy specific Volvo cables to connect right into the system to preserve the Volvo Penta warranty and things like that, right? So it's very, very simple to install. It plugs into 12 or 24 volt power, okay? And it's, uh, it, the whole installation takes place in less than a day. Wow. Now, we do recommend if they install a twist or a twist for pods or things like that, then we go out and do a sea trial because we can customize, you know, like how much throttle like we were talking about earlier, right? So, but everything is done usually in like a six hour time frame. Wow, that's incredible. And it's just the size of a wireless router. This, I mean, yeah, <laughs> Pretty I, yeah, much. I, I, guess, I guess, yes, this is it. So inside here, if I were to open it, is a lot of circuit boards and stuff. So it's built to suit. There's, uh, you know, if you have Volvo engines like this one or S-Link proportional thrusters like this boat, you know, and other boats may have uh, ZF controls or Glenn Denning controls and different types of thrusters. So we just have to put those boards in here. We assemble everything here in the U.S. So... Um, this is the box, yeah. I mean, it's very simple. It's mounted up in, up inside there, and then all the cables are, are pre-made from the factory. Very yeah. easy installation, plug and play, like we like to say. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Right? So let's say the owner of this boat sells it, buys a new boat. Are they able to bring the dock mate with them and reinstall it on their new boat? Well, yes, actually. So the, uh, this particular boat is a very common setup. This says Volvo engines, with a, like a side power proportional thruster. You'll see this on several different types of sun seekers, maybe some princess yachts, things like that. So if this owner wanted to take it to his next boat and he bought it with the same controls, then absolutely. Um, and as our you know, developments are happening, we, you can use the same equipment for several different types of boat. And that's some new the technology that's coming out with DockMate. So um, the answer is yes. I mean, it's an investment for you know now, I mean, you have to pay for it, but you can actually take it with you. So um, we have had owners that are doing that. I mean, we have now just in the short three years that we've been in the U.S., uh, 10 years worldwide, but we've had customers that have already moved their dock made to another boat, sometimes even twice now. Wow, so, good yeah. to know. Yeah, you just remove it and then reinstall it, and it's pretty much pretty simple. Good to know. Yeah.
So is this the only type of remote that you have or are there others? No, so we actually have four different types of remotes. So I have them right here. So okay. um, this is our remote, our single remote, which is just for like single engine boats. Okay. okay. You're just going to get idle speed, forward and reverse, a bow thruster, stern thruster if they have it, anchor, and then your horn. So this is the twin engine version of that. That's called our twin for tw two engines, idle speed, in and out of gear, bow thruster, stern thruster if the boat has it, again, uh, anchor, and then the horn. This is our twist remote. Okay, this is our three axis, uh, fully proportional uh, twist joystick. This is our best seller right here. So, you know, we talked about the proportional throttle control. You can do all that with here. You twist the boat, forward, back, left and right, controls one engine or two engines, bow thruster, stern thruster, uh, anchor, uh, and the horn you push down on it. Okay. And then if the boat is a uh, like a pod boat or has articulating engines, okay, like uh, Volvo Penta IPS or Mercury uh, joystick for Zeus pods or something, they'll use this joystick here and this will articulate the pods and maneuver the boat, do throttle, proportional throttle control, all that. Uh, if the boat has a bow thruster, you can control that with this. Uh, we also, uh, with the Volvo Penta, you can activate the high RPM and if the boats have a sky hook or a dynamic positioning, you can activate it with this button right here. You can also do the anchor and then you push down uh, for the horn as well. So four different types kind of to, to you know, fit everyone's budget, you know, and they range in different pricing depending on the options that they want. So, but we have a remote pretty much for anything anybody wants to do. Do you offer any type of satisfaction guarantee or product warranty? Yeah, so DocMate has like an unbelievable uh, warranty program. So we offer a three-year parts and labor warranty. So we have dealers all over the country. And so it doesn't matter where they have their DocMate installed, if they have it installed here and they go to Massachusetts, we have dealers up there. So three years parts and labor warranty. So we pay the dealer, if God forbid there's ever an issue. So that's really unbelievable. I mean, that's more than like Garmin, right? Um, and the other thing we do, just because we're so, we believe in our product so much, is we offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if they were installing the product and they're like, well, I really don't know how I'm going to use it, and if it's, I, I can't really justify the value, use it. You know what I mean? They they pay it, and if you don't, if you're not 100% satisfied with our product, we will remove the document and give you back all your money. So there's really, I don't know anything else like in the industry that would do that, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, um, but we can never have anybody that take advantage of that just because, I mean, it, I think that it, it, once they have it, it's like, you need it. You know what I mean? It's like a bow thruster on a boat, right? So you can dock a boat without a bow thruster, but having a bow thruster makes it a whole lot easier. Same thing with an autopilot, right? So you can navigate on your boat, go across the Gulf Stream with, uh, with, you know, by hand steering the boat, but if you have an autopilot, it makes it so much easier. So we look at DocMate as those things, you know, as one of those types of uh, add-ons to the boat. So once the owner has that and has that luxury, then they need They don't want to go back. They don't want to go back. <laughs> like roll down windows, you remember? Yeah. Well, you may not remember that, but I mean, now everything's powered. But uh, yeah, same type of a thing, right? So yeah. good to know. Good to know you you offer that, but no one's taking advantage of it, which no. just goes to show how great your product is. Yes, yeah, <laughs> we're fortunate. Yes, thank you. Okay, so how easy is it to actually use a DocMate system? You think I can handle it? It's so easy. You can do it. Okay, let's All try. Right, so Never let's do done this before. So, so here you go. I'm passing. Pass the torch. Passing the torch. All right. There you go. All let's right. So go. just hold it in your hand and let's walk up. Okay. All here right. we go. <laughs> All right, there you go. Okay, here's the test. Let's see. Okay, so <laughs> you have, <laughs> have don't control. be nervous. You have you have full control. You okay. have the con, okay? okay? So, all right, so if you bump it forward, that's gonna be both engines in forward, okay? Bump it, let it go, all right? And then you can bump it in reverse and that'll be both engines in reverse. And then let it go, there you go. Ah, okay. All right, okay, so you enough. can move the joystick sideways and then it'll move the whole boat sideways. You see okay. that? Okay. And then you can go the other way. That's uh, both bow and stern thrust are moving the boat sideways. Okay. Okay. And now if you do it like at a 45, that's going to be just one engine. So do that. There you go. So that's uh -huh. just one engine. See that? Look, you're a pro already. All right. I think we need to go back okay. this way. They, they, look at this. She's All already right. a pro. All right. 
<laughs> All right, so now All right, we're going I'm going to throw some advanced level Gotta stuff slow at down you. A little bit. Okay, <laughs> so now I want you to twist the boat, right? To twist it. So we're going to twist the twist the joystick there. All right, and now that's going to put one engine forward and one engine in reverse. Look at that. All right. Okay. Just slow this way. And then you go that way. Look at you. I got this. You're a pro. Right, you revert. There you go. <laughs> And now you can also individually control your bow and stern thrusters by hitting those buttons there. So that's the stern thruster. And okay. then you got the bow thruster there too. Uh -huh. There you go. You hear that? Uh -huh. So one little... more thing. Try pushing down on the joystick. Oh. <laughs> it does the horn. <laughs> that's cool, huh? How cool is that? All right. Okay. So just bump it in reverse. There you go. All right. You're a pro. Let's see. You got Twist it. Just a little bit. I mean, <laughs> I mean, see, you were scared about two all minutes right, ago, right. and now all of a sudden you're Look like, I here. got this. <laughs> all right, this is cool. Let's see. See that you could go sideways all the way to the dock here now, pretty much. And see that's that? what we're doing. All right, now let go a little bit. Now there okay. you go. Twist it a little bit. There you go. Uh -huh. Perfect. Okay. I mean, this is unbelievable. Bit. People ask about a learning curve for the product. I have never done this before. Full okay. disclosure. Like, like <laughs> literally. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is it. Look at like this. the learning curve is is non-existent with this product. Okay. There you go. Now I'll tap it in reverse a little bit. There you go. Good. So now twist it. To the right. Yep. There you go. And now go sideways to the dock. Look at this. I mean, look at this. Wow. There you go. Here we are. I mean, hit the stern thruster just a little bit. No, the other one. There you go. I mean, and now the bow thruster a little bit. I mean, that's it. I mean, look at you. We could just jump off and right I now the boat. and grab a line. <laughs> And All that's right. it. So that's, I mean, you docked the boat. I docked the boat. Uh, you saw high, it here, folks. a high five. I mean, she <laughs> docked the boat. Never used a dock mate before in her life. And that was it. She just docked the boat. In less than what? Three minutes? I mean, that's it. <laughs> So that's it. We're, you're, we're, you're going on all the tutorials now. All right. <laughs> you saw it first here, folks. Heather docks a boat for the first time with the dock mate. That's it. I love <laughs> so I it. can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> See? Look at the smile. This is why this product is so good. I'm telling you because it makes people smile and it makes my job easy because everybody that uses the product smiles. Yeah. It's, we give everybody a better boating experience. And that's what we love to see, people yeah. smiling. This this is fun. This was this is really cool. Thank you, Mark. I, I'm surprised you trusted me with this, but now that I see how easy it is, I know well, why. Well thanks you to my me. friend for letting me use the boat and <laughs> yeah. trusting you. Now he's gonna see the video of you docking the boat. He's gonna be like, wait, that's not what you told me was happening. So. All right, so Heather, now that you've officially graduated from Dockmate Docking 101. <laughs> We have a shirt for you, okay? It's a nice sun shirt. Awesome, thank you. Okay? But it also... <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I hope I didn't say anything too crazy. No, you were good. You don't good. have to do any bleeps. But when you get a boat, hopefully you won't say that. And awesome. now you have a dock made shirt. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Mark. This has been incredibly fun, very informative, live demonstration for our viewers. Yes. So thank you again. You're welcome. You did great. Thank so. you. And we'll see you right back after this commercial break. Hi, I'm Bob Allen, and I work with a law firm known as Robert Allen Law. We're a law firm dedicated to serving the needs of people in the yacht industry. And that means manufacturers, that means brokers, that means buyers, that means sellers, that means banks, that means people who sell all sorts of things and services to the yacht industry. We're a team of lawyers that has experience in virtually all the fields surrounding this business. And if you're in the business, you know how important it is to work with lawyers who know yachts, right? And know the type of problems that arise and know how to solve them. Our job as lawyers is to help deals get done. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, be of service to the industry. And we look forward to hearing from you if the need arises. Michael here, founder of Concord Marine Electronics. I've got a lot of customers that ask us how it is we've been in business for over 32 years. 
And you can take a look at our glowing Google and Facebook reviews for yourself, but our customers tell me they come back because our proposals are so accurate and our service department is second to none. And on top of that, we've got the technical depth to handle any problems that might come along. We're proud to announce that we've just opened a new location at Lauderdale Marine Center where we're closer to our customers for better service. So when you or your customers are ready for electronic systems completed on time and on budget, call the experts at Concord Marine Electronics. DockMate is a small, handheld, wireless remote control for boat operators. It wirelessly controls the boat's engine, thrusters, anchor, and horn to eliminate those difficult docking situations and give boat owners a better boating experience. Our two-way communication between our remote and our receiver provides the redundant safety features owners are looking for. DockMate is the only wireless remote control that can provide you with smooth, variable, proportional throttle control. Our proprietary customizable software called Dock Control allows us to personalize the DockMate twist exactly to the owner's specifications. Give yourself a better boating experience and install a DockMate today on your vessel. D'Angelo Marine Exhaust was founded in a small shop in Fort Lauderdale in 1986. Today, we occupy over 30,000 square feet of state-of-the-art manufacturing and engineering facilities. We produce, service, and repair marine exhaust systems and diesel particulate filter systems. For more information, go to d'angelomarine.com. Marine Data Solutions. Our affordable, high-speed internet keeps you connected. Marine Data Solutions is proud to provide superior wireless internet for yachting, 10 times faster than your VSAT at a fraction of the cost. Our unlimited internet service includes no throttle, no contract, no activation fee, no overages, no surprises, and same day shipping with 24 7 tech support. Check out our Bahamas Airtime package 300 gigabytes for $350, no throttle. And we offer unlimited gigabytes of unthrottled, high-speed mobile internet service throughout the continental United States. A fixed low monthly cost and no long-term commitment. Call us today to find out more about the best high-speed marine wireless internet. We ship SIMs and equipment anywhere in the world overnight. We are Marine Data Solutions. Wow, it is amazing how technology has made it so easy to dock a boat. Someone with no experience can dock it with no, no problem. It's almost as easy as a video game. It really is amazing. Um, the, the, the ease of use today for people to run their boats, it's really changed things a lot. Yes, and I understand you were at Quantum, Paul. Are you feeling stable? Well, I'm feeling as stable as you could expect me to be. The folks at Quantum can handle this amount of tonnage without any problem at all. Okay, folks, here's a segment I've really been looking forward to. We're at Quantum Stabilizers in Fort Lauderdale, and we're going to learn about the principles of stabilization. 
Let's go inside, talk to John Allen, and see what we can learn today. Come on in, you guys. Hey, John now. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. How's it going? Really well. Nice yeah. to see you. Yeah, thanks pleasure. for having us today. Oh, thanks for we coming really out. appreciate it. So what I was just telling the audience is today's segment on stabilization is really going to be about the principles of stabilization. Mm -hmm. Over the years, we've talked about many different types of stabilizers. We've kind of beaten the gyro stabilizer <laughs> to death. Well, uh, it's a great, why not? You know, it's a great <laughs> unit, and, yeah. it, and it has great applications. Uh, but the reality of it is, gyros is where stabilization really all began. It used to be the heart of the matter, wasn't mm. it? That's correct, yeah. And, uh, you know, the early fin stabilizer units that were built were all uh, had control systems that used these large mechanical gyroscopes. So it read what was going on with the gyro and it told the fins what to do. Now the gyro is actually the stabilizer itself. Yeah, ironic, isn't it? Sort of right? a big turnaround. So, and actually it's even bigger than that because if you think about, I think uh, the 1920s or late 1920s, there was a couple of Italian cruise ships built with massive gyroscopes as a physical stabilizer. And then that sort of abated and then fins took over. Right. And they had a gyroscope that controlled the fin. And now we have gyroscopes that are actually back to doing the job themselves. So it's but a full turnaround. But the fin type stabilizers that we use today mm -hmm. aren't controlled by a gyro. That's all solid state now, right? That's correct, yeah. Okay, so I it's all think. computerized. That's mm -hmm. telling the motors and the control through the control boxes and the fins or whatever the stabilizing product or force is what yeah, to do. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And there's many ways you can stabilize a boat for sure. Okay. But what's even better is this car. It's the only three wheel car that actually is well stabilized. It looks pretty stable to me. It's very stable. It's a three wheel stabilizer. I like that. All right. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll do that. We'll do the cars in another segment. <laughs> let's let's take a look at what we do here at Quantum, how we produce the stabilizers, what you do here, what yeah. do you do? Now you have another facility in the Netherlands, if I'm not mistaken. That's great, Paul. We do. We um we actually build about half the product here and half the product in Holland. Okay. So here in Florida we build the hydraulic systems. They're the the sort of the main mechanical part that actually provides the energy to run the stabilizer okay and um and at the shop in holland uh, we build the actual stabilizer units themselves and the fence and um then we also have the entire control system the control systems are complex and uh, um, the main part of the stabilizer control is built again in holland and then all the control for the power units are controls for the planets were all built here in florida so we're sort of like a international company in, right. in respect that um that the, the entire product is a combined effort of, uh, of um, both here and quantum in Holland. Okay, so what we do with the stabilizer is we have a control unit, a computerized control unit that senses the movement of the boat. That's and correct. And what it does is it tells the hydraulic pumps and the rams mm. which way to move the stabilizing fins or rotors, as the case may be. That, that you know, is that, that is essentially correct. Yeah, that is okay. correct. And that fundamentally hasn't changed from the advent of stabilizers. A control system tells the fins to move, the fins move, they generate lift, and they reduce the roll or they counter the roll of the vessel. And th that concept still exists today, but of course the control systems are not, you know, gyroscopes and mechanical rods and linkages anymore, but they're, like, as you say, solid state and electronic. Okay. And the hydraulic systems are more advanced and the foil designs are, you know, more efficient and all these things, but in general, Nothing's changed. Well, let's take a look at some of the things that you build here. If I'm not mistaken, we have a test facility right here as well. Yep. So we can give a little sense of what we build here, what we go through to build these things. Mm -hmm. We'll take a look at the test facility, and then we'll take a look at some of the other parts of the facility here at Quantum. All right, cool. So these are small power units here. Okay. And as you can see, they're gray, which generally indicates that they're not for a yacht. Okay. So these are sort of military. Most of the yacht stuff is white. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unless you're Roger Penske, then it would be well, red, of course. But, <laughs> there uh, you go. So, um, so anything that's built that's gray in color is a military application. And okay. these particular units here are what we build for the uh, US fast response cutter. That's the FRC. Um, it's a uh, very um, well-known product now in the US. I think there's over 50 in service right. and they're growing all the time. And these are just um, 
So Fixed you've been built, normal you, stabilizers. So you guys built for the military. Is it just the Coast Guard, or do you build for the Navy as well? No, we built for the U.S. Navy and also many foreign navies as well. So okay. that's quite a big part of our business. Okay. And then you see white equipment, and if it's white, right. this is then it, it belongs to a yacht. So this is, of course, that's a relatively small power unit. This is quite a large one. But in general, principles are the same. Um, these, these larger power units have to have sound shields fitted to reduce noise, uh, large cooling systems because they operate under uh, quite harsh environments in terms of what they have to produce, their efficiency. Uh, they run at pretty much close to full capacity. And what size boat with a system like that? So, so this, uh, this power unit would go um, on a boat of say 65 or 75 meters. Okay. So that one unit would run the entire stabilizer package on, let's, for example, a 65 meter boat. And would that be a single set of stabilizers, or uh, in some cases, is it twin sets of stabilizers? It would most likely in this application, if it's one power unit, it would be just two stabilizers or okay. one pair. So you have a separate power system for, for each, each set. But they probably would talk to each other, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And then if the stabilizers get bigger, which they do, the larger units, then we have an individual hydraulic power unit for an individual for stabilizer. stabilizer. So if you looked at, uh, say, a 130 meter boat, where it would always typically have four fins, then there'd be four power units. And wow. so each stabilizer unit becomes quite independent to itself. And what's really nice in the bigger ships is they de dedicate an entire room within the ship just for the stabilizer. So there's each stabilizer, and if there's four, you have four individual rooms on the ship, which are solely dedicated to that stabilizer unit and all its equipment that well, goes with it. you've got a lot of equipment, you've got a lot of <laughs> noise. Yep. Is there a lot of heat generated by it as there well? There is, yeah, so you have to abate the heat and you always have to uh, minimize all the noise uh, within the system because, of course, we know that it runs all the time and it runs when people are sleeping. And we've also learned, you know, in, in the boating world, we've learned that if you have the room and the facilities to have a dedicated room to a specific application facilitates maintenance. You do, you're, it's easier to do maintenance, you're more inclined to do the maintenance, you yeah. do the maintenance properly, and it lasts for a lot longer. That's, that's true. So um, when we build the hydraulic systems here, they, they get built here and generally they go directly to the shipyard. Okay. But before they can go to the shipyard, we have to test, test them and make sure, sure they work. So we have a, a tester facility here. It's a um, sort of a dedicated room where we can test power, hydraulic power systems and the controls that go with them. And we have a cooling tower and a water supply, so we're able to uh, simulate the uh, cooling system. And we have a load bank where we can actually create the load that the stabilizer would put on the hydraulic system. Well, it looks like you can test any kind of system that's going to go anywhere in the world, yep. no matter whether it's 50 cycle, 60 cycle, three phase, four phase, whatever the case may be. That's it. We can, we can run almost every voltage that we deal with from uh, 208 to, to uh, 480, and we can run 50 or 60 hertz, however the case may be. So we're able to take the hydraulic system in its entirety and run it at full capacity and create um, uh, all the conditions that we would expect to see on the boat. And that in itself is quite critical because once the unit is installed in the boat and we actually go to commission it, we have uh, very little time to actually correct anything that's wrong and get it running and do the sea trial. So we want to do as much as we can before the equipment gets to the shipyard. Well, so it we goes have... in as a unit when it goes to the exactly. shipyard as well. Exactly. And that way there's less opportunity for failure yep. because it's been assembled, tested, and then shipped from here, and it's almost a plug and play type of system when it gets there. Well, that's the goal. I'm not that's can't say theory. it's always plug and play. Right. It's not a VCR, but <laughs> right. Right. or a Blu-ray player or anything well, else. Well, you and I remember VCRs and <laughs> yeah. Blu-ray players. Or an 8-track player. <laughs> there you go. Cassettes. It's cassettes. There yeah. you there go. Yeah. So, so anyway, these but, are valves here, right? Uh, yeah. So these are uh, manifolds. And, manifolds. And, you know, okay. a big part of a hydraulic system is, is, the, is the manifold system. It's the that movement goes of the it. hydraulic fluid yeah. and where and, it goes. Exactly. And we have to be extremely efficient about that. And the way to do that and keep efficiency and also be able to design uh, product-specific parts is to do your own design work. Okay. So these manifolds, we design the manifolds, we do all the 3D modeling for the manifolds, and then we have them manufactured for okay. us. So we're able to uh, uniquely design for our products and not okay. use equipment that's manufactured for other applications. And that's important. Absolutely. So we've got uh, yacht applications, we've got military applications. Mm -hmm. Looks like we've got a complete electronics room in there because it's not just a hydraulic system. There's an awful lot of electronics that controls all of it, correct? That's right. So we have a lot of control work that goes into our systems and the controls are often unique for each application. So that means that 
we have a job that might be for, you know, a, a fed ship or something like that. And their job could be different to a job that we might be building for another shipyard. Right. So um, our controls and our uh, electronics engineers here at Quantum, they develop and design the, the control system. And then the guys here build it. And we write all our own code for our PLCs and programming. And, uh, and that's all, all so done. Everything's here. built right here in house. Yeah, all in house. Put together with machinery, yep. sent into the test room, sent to the facility. We, the fins come in or the rotors come in from the facilities overseas. They yeah. all meet at the yard. It's all assembled. Now, yeah. Does the shipyard do the installation? Or yeah. do you have technicians that go and do the installation? No, we generally don't get involved in the installation, but we do provide like on-site support, for sometimes supervision, uh, visits if they need. And if, if a part of our product has to be disassembled to be installed, which is not uncommon, then we'll go and, uh, and facilitate the support for that and do the assembly on site. If I'm not mistaken, we've got engineering and we've also got some examples upstairs where we can take a look at how this stuff really works. We can. Let's we go can take do a that. Peek. Let's go check it out. So, John, while we're on our way up to engineering to have a look at, I think you've got some 3D models of how some of this stuff is designed and it'll give the audience a better idea of uh, applications and, and what the products look like. You know, there's, there's something that comes to mind We've had several things that have really changed the yachting industry over the course of the last, say, 15 to 20 years. Um, I would have to say that stabilization has become ubiquitous because I, I remember in my days of running boats, we didn't have stabilizers. Uh, some true. of the guys with the Hatteras motor yachts would have them. The yeah. bigger boats would have them. Uh -huh. But what do you think is probably the one thing that has affected your side of the business more than anything else over the years? Well, I think it's quite clear, and it's not just for me, but it's the whole industry is the, uh, the real game changer is zero speed. If yeah. you think uh, 20 years ago, there was no, uh, the word zero speed didn't exist. There was no stabilizer right. that worked at anchor, particularly. And um, boats yeah. were sort zero, of- Zero speed was an oxymoron. Yeah, what was that? <laughs> so, you know, so that's the real game changer. You know, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we, we have a pretty active uh, charter membership at mm -hmm. IYBA. Yep. And I think you could argue that a boat without zero speed stabilizers is basically just not viable in the charter yeah. marketplace yep. in, the, in the boats over, let's say, 75, 80 feet. So yeah. what, had, what that has done is it has allowed the yachting community to not be reliant upon going to a marina every single night. It mm. gives people more autonomy, it gives yep. them more independence, it gives mm. them the ability to cruise to far-flung places and yeah. still maintain perfect levels of comfort. It is, and if you think about it, when we say it's a game changer, it's a lifestyle game changer because, you know, as you and I both know, many of the owners of the large yachts don't actually travel on the boat. They travel to the boat when it gets to a location. Right. So their experience of the stabilizers was not really that great because they were, you know, if they were on the way, they made a small trip from one island to another, but they didn't make great passages. But now the stabilizer is unique to them because it's a device that's operational all the time they're on the boat. And if it's not operational when they're on the boat, they're not on they the may boat. not be on the boat. Yeah. Right. That's why so they have a Gulf Stream big difference. or a, yeah. uh, an AS350 to get them to yeah. the airport. So it's sort of gone from being a, a, a product that was embedded in the bottom of the boat somewhere and nobody really knew much about it right. to be in a lifestyle product because it affects the lifestyle of the people on board the boat. So it's one of the more critically important components of the boat, yeah. as important as a fully rigged galley, as important as a great entertainment system, yeah. as important as beach clubs and, and you know, dinghy garages and, and toys. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, it's that product that is expected. It's got to work 24 hours a day. Day. seven days a week mm -hmm. it's got to be reliable it's got to be quiet yep. it can't consume a lot of energy yep. because we have a finite amount of energy we can produce mm -hmm. and we have other systems that are going to put a demand on the boat as well that's true that's true it's a very uh, i think it's taken a, a a big shift stabilizers it's become much more front and center to the clients themselves and uh, and you hear about it all the time now when uh, you know and i say now you know the last uh, 10 years when um, a client sign in for a new boat, you know, the, the actual client themselves or, or the wife might ask about what's the stabilizer, how do they work, what kind of stabilizer are they getting? Well, 20 years ago, they would never have had Completely that question. Completely out of mind. Yeah, it would have been out of mind. 
and they they typically don't dive in and go, what kind of gearbox are we getting on this boat? You know, <laughs> What's the reduction they, on What is that reduction boat? on that gearbox? What kind of oil are you using? <laughs> right. But, you know, you mentioned stabilizers and everybody, you know, looks around and, you know, they go, oh, well, of course we're getting, you know, whatever. The best whatever it is. Whatever we, right. you know, whatever's in the space. And, spec, and but, the fact know. of the matter is, even in the outboard marketplace these days, yeah. stabilizers are an yeah. important part of the conversation. They are. If we don't have it, I'm not going. Yeah, that's true. And even when you look at uh, Seakeeper and the small gyros that they mm -hmm. make in that market, I mean, who would have thought, you know, 15 years ago, you were going to buy a 32-foot center console with a stabilizer in it? Oh, that was absolutely you not would never a part heard of the picture. Of and yet, it's, a, again, another sort of mainstream product now. So, right. So, yeah, it's a game changer. Yeah, it's a, it's a big piece yeah. of the puzzle. Yeah. So, we're going to take a look at some of the 3D yeah. of uh, the systems in their entirety and maybe some fins and applications, and then we'll go into the uh, into yeah. the training room, and we actually have some mock-ups in we there do. of product that uh, uh, is, for, is for training purposes. That's correct. That okay. We do, yeah. So we do have, um, here we try to design, all, most of the stuff's all designed in 3D anyway. Okay. But we try to model everything, and we do the designs. So we do the engineering of what we're, we're going to build, and then we send it out for manufacture. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, sort of akin to the manifold that we were looking at a little right, while ago downstairs. down below. Sure. So all this whole thing would have been designed uh, you know, by Kevin or one of the other guys here. And okay. then they'll work through the process, process of it. It's unique to that particular product. There's nothing off the shelf about the design. We use, of course, components that are, are built off the shelf. So this would um, be the exploded view of yeah. that manifold that we saw downstairs, That's or right. one like it. Yeah. And the, the oil goes in, the oil goes around, the oil comes out well, in whatever yeah. the controller yeah. tells it to do. Exactly. So, okay. so all the, all of our products like that are designed either here or in Holland, okay. and they're all designed unique and specific to the uh, the projects themselves, to or the application, the application that we're working on at the time, which okay. is critical. Uh, so anyway, mm -hmm. and um, also we do our own controls design here. So. Uh, not only do we do the mechanical design of the components in the hydraulic system, but we also work on the controls, the software, um, uh, programming, and all the different applications, touchscreen design, graphics, and all those sorts of things. And, uh, and all that's done up here, um, or at the shop in Holland. One so of the two you'll, you'll outsource the hose, maybe the fittings, yep. uh, some castings and stuff, but all the bits and pieces are designed here Integrated for specific right applications. Here. Yeah. And uh, so we're able to not only, um, you know, sort of simulate uh, control technology like we would have here, so we can actually simulate a system working, but we also, uh, so we, we have these, um, you know, sort of control systems set up which, which can replicate what the actual stabilizer is doing. So without have, okay. actually being connected to a stabilizer, the control system can, can mimic what the stabilizer is going to do, and it, and it can get responses back from these controls, which represent what the stabilizer would be doing. So okay. we were able to simulate as much as possible. I mean, ideally, when you build something, especially uh, a company like Quantum, where we're forward thinking and we're constantly, you know, inventing or coming up with new ideas, you know, ideally, you like to beta test everything, and you want to go out there and you want to build a prototype and test it and then sell it. But it just doesn't work that way in our industry because we don't have a super yacht to play around with on weekends. So we have to. A lot of our testing is done in the field. We do as much as we possibly can here, um, or in the MAR, in the model tank in Holland, or at the shop in Holland. But at the end of the day, the product gets integrated into the ship, and then we have to go to work on it. And um, we, almost all of our prototypes have actually you know, ended up in a boat somewhere. But your, your experience in, from one boat to the next gives you the, the foundation to be able to make your applications properly mm -hmm. for the new designs that may come from Espen Oino or Corderover or whomever is, is, is designing, doing the naval architecture mm -hmm. and saying, okay, here's, here are the specifics of the boat. Quantum, we need the proper set of stabilization for this boat. Your previous experience in other boats is gonna tell you that you need to scale up, scale down, move it forward, move it aft, inboard, outboard, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, to have the proper application and it's, Correct. it's the it's through the engineering that you're able to determine that yep. because we don't have 300,000 units a year that <laughs> yeah. we're building. We don't. And we yeah. can we yes. can do a couple of tests and then just replicate it time and time again. Yeah, everyone and, is different. And, it's, and you always want to you know you always want to gravitate back to the things that you built before because you have experience with that. But our industry, you know, and probably much like other industries, is a forward moving industry. So you sure really do want to continue to develop your product and improve your product and. Uh, and that's it. That's it. Well, let's take a factor. walk in the training room and yeah. let's see. Let's see some of the products that you're talking about. There's uh, there's one in there that's particularly intriguing to me because I think it's so innovative. And, and we talked about it a little bit more. We'll explain it some more. But uh, on this, you know, in this sector, 
Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have that's really unique and unusual, and we don't think about it quite so often, technology moves forward based upon demand and based upon funding. Mm -hmm. And when you have large applications like uh, nav systems for automobiles, or just let's think about you know, the parking sensors. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really a transducer, right? Yeah. And transducers were expensive when we wanted to put them in boats. But <laughs> when there's suddenly a demand for 12 million transducers per yeah. year, yep. they figure out through economies of scale, less expensive ways to make them. Yeah, But in sure. our applications, the reverse is true. We have few of the units, but we have the resources. We yep. have a demand from a public mm -hmm. that is, uh, perfectly well suited to have whatever it is that they want yeah. and they'll pay for it. And I'm not suggesting that what you build is expensive for any other reason other than the fact that it's very technical, it's very unique, yeah. it's very high quality, and these we don't have these economies of scale to replicate it and, and drive costs down. No, we don't. But what we do have is we have a client base that's prepared to invest in it and they want to see new technology. So you often see this, and we see it in our industry, in our company because we're sort of about 25% military. Mm -hmm. And for military applications, there's no possibility for development. Right. You can't go to the military and say, hey, by the way, we have this new idea, you know, what we'd like to think? try it out on the boat. You right. know, it'd, uh, chase you out of the door. It's not gonna happen. Right. But if you have a new idea in, in the yacht, private yachting sector, and, and you can prove it in some way um, that, hey, you know, this is something we, we don't have it in service, but we've tested it, and this is what it can do. Um, there's uh, far more, much more interest in, in bringing that to market. So consequently, you, you do see uh, our products um, and other companies' products much more in advanced than what you'd see in the military application because the military application is still working on specification from you know, 27 years ago. Right. You know? In fact, it's not uncommon to get, and we were talking about gyros and control systems in the, uh, you know, when you first came in, um, it's very, very common to see a specification out for a ship construction, a, a military um, warship, patrol boat, where they actually specify a gyro stabilizer control. And you have to go back to the, you know, whoever's been in the job and say, like by the way, we don't make that anymore. Right. You know, nobody makes that. And they say, well, it's in the specification from 1963. You know, we'll have to get an act of Congress to change this one. You know, right. so you sure you can't supply that? And we say, no, no, we don't make that anymore. Can, so, you, can you find a guy from 1963 <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. to build it for us? Right. So that, that's really common and you do see it. And the technical specifications are, are very fixed and you have to adhere to them. So when you have something like that, that's carried over for many, many years, eventually you have to talk the the government or whoever's right in the spec to change gears or something like that. One of the that. amazing and fascinating things about the industry that we have the pleasure of working in is that people of substance are willing to invest in these new technologies mm. and investigate yeah. new technologies yeah. and try things based upon you know good foundational science and evidence, but they're willing to do things that really push the envelope, That's that true. really break the barriers. Yep. So what we've got here is a mock-up of a system installed in a boat, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, very similar. In fact, more probably more, uh, because we, we use various things for training up here, but okay. um, we have represented as, a, as the mechanical unit, which is this would be the stabilizer. So you would have a, actually a fin mounted on that shaft there That's on correct. the inside of the hull. So, okay. But for training purposes, we don't need the fin, of but we have not. the hull unit. And then uh, we've made quite a few different control systems over the years, so we, we always maintain one or two, or in this case, three different control systems. Right. Um, and we can turn any one on or off at a time if we're particularly interested. And we can also use this up here for ourselves for simulating things, like a simulating a, a bug or something that we might have, where we can run the entire system. We have a frequency drive, we have a hydraulic power unit, right. and we have uh, manifolds, and we even have a roll sensor here that's on a small table that um, moves backwards and forwards and sort of, you know, it simulates the vessel simulate rolling. Simulates the movement of the boat. Yeah. So we're able to do all of that from this, you know, this uh, sort of training setup here. Okay. And generally, when we do training, um, we can have generic training, which we do for some of the engineers on the boats, which is not uncommon. Um, if it's a big boat, we'll try to tailor the training just 
for the system that they have on the boat. So we'll get rid of some of these components and only bring in the components that are relevant to them. Right. And then we'll do an entire training on maintenance and operation and things like that. And then we have other training, which is training for our own people, our own service engineers, our technicians. And we try to have as much as everything as we can around, you know. Sure. Say, we could even look at a VFD that we wouldn't use anymore, but we might still do training because they're out there in the field and the, the service department have to deal with that. So we have to right. teach them about those things. So we use the training facility for lots of things, training the clients, doing military training, and then internal training for our own people. And sure. that's very important. It's very important to, you know, when you have technical products like these, and especially when you have products that are constantly in development and improvement, you've got to sort of bring the train into the front and you've got to show people how it works, and especially our own people. Else, uh, you know, you're kind of in trouble if you can't support well, you what you can't, built. You can't fix it. Yeah. But so, you're, you're, yeah. you bring a great point, and that is that it is a very complex and technical system, and it's not something that you hire a guy to go down in the engine room and just, there's the switch, turn it on, and <laughs> yeah. that's it. He yeah. actually has to know how to operate the system, yeah. troubleshoot the system, maintain the system, mm -hmm. because as we t spoke about earlier, these boats go to far flung places yeah. in the world and if there is an issue I mean there's nothing that doesn't break right no exactly so there and and that's gonna that's another point that I'd like to talk about here in just a moment uh, and for just a moment and that is how do we know if things are breaking you mentioned to me earlier uh, before we started our segment here that you have the ability to do some monitoring remotely if mm -hmm. the client wants it yeah through the system as it's built in so that Let's say I'm in Tierra del Fuego mm -hmm. and I have a problem with my left, my port stabilizer yeah. on the boat. What do I do? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Call. <laughs> Call oh, somebody. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I got a problem with yeah. my stabilizer, Chat John. Line. Yeah, what, what do we do? What's yeah. wrong with it? It's not stabilizing. Yeah. You're going to have to be more specific than that, yeah. Paul. Yeah, how do, we, how do we figure that out? Yeah, so um, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, becomes more and more unique, of course, because the, the products are more and more complex. And then they are more complex because we're trying to do more. We're trying to have a more efficient product that runs longer periods of time and it's quieter. And to do that, we have to, you know, advance the product. And what happens is people, you know, sort of get overwhelmed. They, you know, they see the stabilizer, but they see all this equipment that goes with it. And, you know, and it's not something that they work on every day that, you know, they're running the boat and suddenly it doesn't work. And for us, uh, we don't always get all the information about what's going on. Um, so we, we like the ability to connect to the system. And for some 10 years now, uh, most of the systems that we built have a built-in internet access. Uh, we call it an E1 module. It'd be built okay. into all the controls and uh, they just have to connect up to it. And once they're connected up to it, we have complete uh, discovery within the entire system. So we can reach into the control and then we can reach down to the stabilizer unit. We can even see this is a, an automatic greasing system. We can see what the greasing system is doing. Uh, we can take over the control system, which is here. Um, we can start the system, we can adjust the system, and we can record data from the system. And we can do all that remotely. And that is absolutely critical. And for quantum, and especially in the most recent times, the last year or so, it's become uh, quintessential. Well, you that can't even send in. a text sometimes. You can't. You, you can't can send a part board. and yeah. instructions on how to put it in. Yeah. But so it's key to be able to diagnose and troubleshoot the yeah, issue all the time, so that you send the right part and you get them back up, back up and running as fast as you can. And in fact, recently we had a new boat was just being delivered, and they were in some quite heavy seas, and they, they'd reached out to us. There's no way we could have got to the boat, and anyway, not at that particular time in the middle of the ocean, but you know, sort of in the middle of the night, we were dialed in and connected to the boat and we were looking at what was going on and we made some adjustments. We talked to the operators about it and, uh, you know, the system was, uh, was up and running. Now. We're back yeah, up and running. Up and, running. And, um, and we also identified things that needed to be corrected as well. So it's not like, oh, you know, we dialed in and pressed the magic button so everybody's happy and let's go back to bed, don't worry about it. You know, it's never you, that. You don't have but... a level button here at the <laughs> yeah, office yeah, that just says, to... okay guys, so, let me reset yeah, the system. Let's hang up. <laughs> right. it's a, you know, the, uh, oh, poor internet connection, sorry. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it's so critical. Um, and, and you know, that brings it all the way home is these boats aren't tied to a dock somewhere. They're all over the planet um, and they need, they're used to getting fast responses. You're used to jumping on the internet, typing a message to somebody, and you get an answer back, you get on a chat line or whatever. And for us, you know, 
we're, we're, would be slow to respond if we had to put somebody on a plane and, and meet the boat in Cartagena or something like that. And just to do that right now is almost impossible anyway. So to be able to say, okay, could you open up your internet access, which is there, they have the ability to do that. We can turn us on and turn us off. Connectivity. Yep. So they give us connectivity right here in this building um, in our uh, electrical engineering department. They can see the thing come live and they can dial straight in, connect to it. And, and you've got in. dedicated secure servers. Well, so you know, the, the issues of someone getting into the system or doing something untoward. Yeah. It's, a, it's a discreet, secure connection. It's used for the period of time that you're connected to the boat to diagnose, to troubleshoot, upload, download data, and then it goes off and it's not something that remains as an open uh, vulnerability source, if you will. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, we all know nobody wants you dialing in when they're not looking that's at you. Another whole, that's another whole the, segment yeah, to talk about. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. But, but we did develop a, a system here um, where we use a dedicated server. So we have, a, I think, over 140 boats or something that we can connect to that are equipped for a connection. Um, and all those modules on those boats can only respond to this, the one server. So you can't dial in from any other location. You have to go through the dedicated server. So we have a protocol for it. We developed it um, with the, uh, our IT people here at Quantum. And we present that always to the clients and say this is how it works. But at the end of the day, they plug us in, they unplug us. That's, uh, that's, that's fascinating. And it also gives you the ability for product development as you go forward. Yeah. You see maybe yeah. uh, touch points that are... Uh, ones that pose challenges repeatedly or uh, something that needs to be upgraded in your manufacturing and improvement of your products. Yeah, so I that's, mean, a that's great how opportunity. you do it. It's so this is something that fascinates me. Mm -hmm. you know, like I've said, I've been around this for a little while, yeah. um, but the rotor stabilizer is mm. a concept that I didn't understand well until you explained it to me a little earlier. And I would dare say that I'm not alone in the industry <laughs> of not understanding it. Now, I happen to know a little bit about lift yeah. and low pressure versus high pressure and the Bernoulli effect, mm -hmm. but tell us a little bit about what, what brought the development of the rotary stabilizer forward and where the application makes sense. And is it ever a hybrid application where you maybe would use this and fins? Yeah. Well, tell us about so, that a little bit. So uh, the Magnus effect, which is essentially what we're dealing with here, and th this particular unit is one of the smallest that we've uh, built, and it's sort of partially deployed at this time. Right. So normally it would drop down out of the pocket and swing out to 90, 90 degrees, degrees to, the hull. to the whole side, but it's okay. sort of partially retracted right now. Let's say it's stuck. Right. <laughs> anyway. Well, we can um, dial into yeah, the engineering yeah, department and find another See problem. if we can get it fixed. Yeah. There you go. So, um, so anyway, we use a smooth uh, cylinder. This is a carbon cylinder. I think almost all of the uh, rotors that we built have either been carbon or GRP. This is a carbon cylinder. Okay. It's smooth. Often people think that it might have a rough texture, but it doesn't. Right. But it doesn't. Um, there's no real difference between a rough texture or a smooth texture. And it rotates. Um, and while it's rotating, uh, if you pass a medium of air or water or any kind of you know, uh, medium over the surface of the rotating uh, device, it generates high and low pressure. So the theory is called the Magnus theory. It's the same thing that we see uh, with golf balls. Uh, when they slice the ball and it climbs, that's the Magnus effect. A tennis ball, when you hit it, top, top spin, spin or which bottom, causes it to, to drop. drop over yeah. the net. So that, that in itself is the Magnus effect. And, okay. and essentially, this is what we do with the rotor. So the rotational force causes it to curve, it does. if you will. Yeah, so okay. it, it, it has differential pressure across the surface. The faster you rotate the device, the greater the lift is or the greater the differential pressure. So by... Um, by uh, increasing the RPM, we can increase the lift, and also uh, by changing the direction, we can create the lift in, in the One opposite side of direction. The boat or the yeah. other side. Of yeah. The boat. So okay. very much like a stabilizer fin, where we move, change the angle of the fin to generate more lift. Right. With the rotor, we just increase the RPM. Okay. But the unique qualities of the rotor, um, apart from the fact that it's retractable, you know, right. but the unique qualities is that it has a very high lift coefficient, and that allows it to create lift at slow speeds, where a fin would not particularly being its uh, foray of best performance, the rotor at the slower speed, seven to uh, 10 knots or so, can uh, actually perform very well. So by having a, a, a rotary stabilizer or a Magnus effect stabilizer, you can you know, sort of open that, uh, the, the operational profile of the stabilizer system and have much lower speeds. So this has a particularly good applicability to displacement boats, trawlers, if you will. Yes, very much so. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you'll also employ this system in combination with a fin-type stabilizer 
in larger boats. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's correct. And so you how know, would that application play out? How would that work? Well, you know, if we talk about the Magnus effect, we start talking about it for a little while, and, and then you start to think, well, why would you have a stabilizer fin if the Magnus is so good? But, you know, there is no silver bullet. We all know that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the uh, Achilles heel to the rotor is that it doesn't perform so well at the highest speed. So it's not a great stabilizer. So about stabilizer. 10 knots is where it starts to lose efficacy. Uh, around, actually, they, they, they operate reasonably well to about 14 knots. Okay. But we, uh, on our bigger units, we try to sort of curtail activities around 12 knots, and we start to retract around 14 to 15 knots. Okay. Um, so if you've got a boat that has a, cruise, a normal cruise speed of 15 to 18 knots, then the Magnus effect alone would not be the stabilizer for that application. However, its merits are so high, and it has so much potential in other areas, that a combination of fins and the Magnus effect rotor is, is probably one of the best and most broad reaching stabilizer systems you could have on a boat today. And that is quite common um, on boats in the sort of 80 to 120 meter range. So now. in the bigger boats, we may have a set of rotary stabilizers aft. That's correct. And the fin stabilizers forward. Yeah. And at slow speeds, we'd be using the two of them. What about in a zero speed application? So zero speed application, the rotor um, actually rotates in one direction only, and then the entire device swings underneath the boat through about 120 degrees. And so by swinging the rotor backwards and forwards, we're able to generate lift, we can generate flow over the rotating cylinder, and then we can get the lift back. So we have a great a zero speed application. It can work in conjunction with a standard fin or an XT fin. Um, we have a great slow speed application. And also the rotor um, is, less inclined to suffer from the effects of heavy reversing of the ship or anything like that. So we can actually keep the rotor active in its zero speed mode uh, up to about three knots and then automatically we can switch into the underway mode. So we, we, it can be quite automatic when it transits from its operation in zero speed to its operation underway. Unlike a fin where uh, when we get over three knots the fin sort of parks itself and then once the speed increases then the operators have to restart the fin or turn it back on. So. Now you hmm. mentioned uh, an XT fin. That's an innovation of yours, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Where the center of the fin actually extends down. So if I'm not mistaken, it's 30% more surface area, but 100% more efficacy. It is for zero speed. So for the, zero speed, the okay. XT fin was another sort of landmark device for us, I think in 2005, when we uh, filed the first patent on it. Um, the idea was that for zero speed, we needed larger fins than we needed underway. And we were sort of novices in the zero speed game back then. There was not that many systems out there. And Everybody we were, was. Yeah, we were just developing the thing. So we thought um, the concept was that how could we have make a larger fin when we were at zero speed, but have a nice and more you know practical fin for underway um, when the boat's underway. So we came up with the uh, XT design. Um, it's, it's really been the standby of everything we've done. I'd say that it's sort of eclipsed even standard fins for us now, and almost everything we sell is an XT. But you're correct, we have a foil that's located inside the main fin, and we deploy it, and when we deploy the foil, it increases the fin area for zero speed. And all of that is on your website? Yeah. On quantum.com? Uh, quantum yeah, quantumstabilizers.com. Quantumstabilizers.com, yeah. and you can see the rotary, you yep. can see the XT, you can see exploded views of the systems, you can see explanations, the yep. physics, the science, the theory, yep. the, the reality. That's fascinating. I think this is a completely different look at stabilization than we've had the opportunity to have before. I really appreciate you taking the time, John. Yep. I think that's all the time we have in this segment, but it was fascinating. Okay. The audience can ask their questions in the chat room, and you can also go to quantumstabilizers.com or watch this video again on iyba.org on the events folder. Thanks for joining us, and now we'll go back to a commercial break. Florida Nautical Surveyors is your complete solution to all your vessel surveying needs. Our team of seasoned experts led by Malcolm Elliott are the go-to solution for pre-purchase, insurance, or valuation surveys. Whether your vessel is steel, aluminum, fiberglass, wood, or even ferro-cement, our surveyors have the knowledge and training to meet all of your surveying needs. Call Florida Nautical Surveyors today at 954-801-2140. Or for more information, go to floridanauticalsurveyors.com.
industry has learned that to control your data is to control your destiny. Yachtbroker.org is the key to that control. As a member of any professional yachting association, when you input your data, you are the owner of that information. At Yachtbroker.org, you can keep track of all data reports related to your company by viewing your customized live management dashboard. Create an eye-catching photo gallery with our new thumbnail editor. Follow vessels of your liking to get status notifications in current time. Identify special commission conditions immediately. And even report a vessel to our team and the listing broker. Need to have access to your fleet on the go? Yachtbroker.org is completely mobile optimized, so you can view and edit your listings from anywhere in the world. For more information on how you can get started using yachtbroker.org, give us a call at 954-522-9270 or email me at casey at iyba.org. Marine Professionals MPI has been in business since 1997. With over 20 years of experience, we at MPI provide you the very best in marine electronics, audio, video, and networking. We specialize in boats from 40 to 120 feet. If you need navigation, including Garmin, Raymarine, or any other top brands, MPI is your go-to source. If you need audio video equipment, MPI can provide you with HD TV and the very best sound with a Sonos Hi-Fi sound system. MPI is the only marine gold Sonos dealer in the country. Nowadays, everybody wants high-speed internet. MPI can offer you different solutions that fit your needs. Whether it's to pick up the marina Wi-Fi, cellular, or satellite, MPI has you covered. We'll make sure you can binge watch your favorite Netflix episodes anywhere, anytime you want. You can check us out online at marineprofessionals.com or call us today. I'm Mark Carreri and I approve this message. At Murray Ventilation Products, we bring over 20 years of experience providing ventilation and air filtration solutions. MVP is your most valuable player in demisters, intake and exhaust fans, and computer-controlled safety systems. We are well-equipped to provide end-to-end -end solutions for OEMs and refit projects the world over. Call Murray Ventilation Products today at 772-631-2229. Maritime arbitration has been around for hundreds of years. Now we have a new forum to solve our disputes. The IYBA has created the International Yacht Arbitration Council to solve our disagreements. We have experienced maritime attorneys and yacht brokers to serve on our panels, people who know the law, who know boats, and who know the yacht business. IYAC arbitration can handle yacht claims, contract, purchase, and commission disputes privately, quickly, and less costly than going to court. Sometimes disputes happen, and when they do, the IYAC is here to help you solve them. Well, that was a lot of information, and thanks so much to the folks at Pantropic Caterpillar, at Docmate, and at Quantum Stabilizers for providing us the opportunity to learn all the things that we learned today. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us. Please join us again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. sharp for Yacht, Yacht Engineering, Engineering Week 2021. 2021. See, you See you tomorrow. tomorrow. Yacht Engineering Week 2021 has been made possible by Pantropic Power the only authorized Caterpillar Power Systems dealer in South Florida. Florida Nautical Surveyors, your complete solution to all of your vessel surveying needs. And Robert Allen Law, exclusively dealing with the business of yachting. We would also like to thank Quantum Stabilizers, AME Solutions, D'Angelo Exhaust, MPI Marine Professionals Incorporated, Concord Marine Electronics, Lauderdale Marine Center, Marine Data, Isotropic, Dockmate, and Murray Ventilation Products. Thanks for joining us. See you tomorrow.